want to thank everybody who is joining us this afternoon to cover some updates from the 2024 legislative session. Uh, 2024 session was a short session, so uh, we do have fewer items to go over than last year's presentation. I think that one topped out uh, a little over 100 slides, so we've got a, a little bit less this year, which is good. Before we get started, I'm going to go over our standard disclaimer. So this presentation, as well as any of the corresponding legislative update memos or checklists or templates or things that the department uh, issues as a resource for local government officials, um, just always keep in mind that they are not meant as legal advice. They are just uh, informative in nature and that the Indiana Code is always going to govern. So for this afternoon's webinar, we're going to go over seven different topics uh, and each of these seven topics does have a corresponding legislative update memo that was released by the department yesterday afternoon and can be found on our website. We're going to get started with the assessment matters legislation from the 2024 session. First up, we have Senate Enrolled Act 246, and this uh, legislation related to wetlands and the ability uh, for wetlands to be classified as wildlands for pur purposes of property assessment. The legislation specified that if a parcel of land uh, meets certain requirements, parcel is at least half acre in size, parcel contains wetlands, and the parcel otherwise meets the requirements uh, for classification as wildlands under Indiana code section 6-1.1-6, it can be classified as wildlands. For example, uh, looking at that you know, sub number three of meeting the other requirements, uh, there's language in you know, Indiana code section 1-1.1-6-2.5, and it specifies uh, different criteria for when land can be classified as wildlands. Uh, there's a list of five different uh, criteria that can be considered if one or more of those listed criteria apply. So that's just one example of uh, a place to look for additional criteria requirements. The bill also specified that any qualifying parcels that are classified as wildlands for purposes of assessment, uh, the property owner must post two signs on different sides of the parcel, either at the outermost corners or at points that are the most conspicuous to the public. The signs that have to be posted identifying the space as wildlands will be furnished by the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, additional information regarding the required signs can be found on the Department of Natural Resources website, and a link to their website can be located within the uh, department's legislative update memo. Next bill we're going to go over is House Enrolled Act 1090. Now this was the NDOT or Indiana Department of Transportation's omnibus agency bill, uh, but there is one section that is relevant for purposes of assessing officials and auditors alike, and it relates to the sales disclosure form. Under the section one of that bill, uh, it specifies that property conveyances to the state uh, do not require the submission or completion of a sales disclosure form. However, the department would note that it does not exempt property conveyances from the state. So if property is sold or acquired by the state from a private entity or nonprofit or other unit of government, uh, they would no longer need to complete a sales disclosure form before recording that property conveyance. However, if property that is owned by the state is conveyed to a private entity or nonprofit, um, that would still require the completion of a sales disclosure form. To just highlight what the language in under section one of the bill did, it touches on uh, subsection B of Indiana code 6-1.1-5.5-2, which lists out the type of property conveyances that do not require a sales disclosure form as they are not considered to be conveyance documents under the statute. Currently, the list includes security interest documents, leases, uh, for terms of less than 90 years, agreements or other documents related to mergers, consolidations, and an incorporation that are involving solely non-listed stock, quick claim deeds not serving as a source of title, and public utility or governmental easements or rights of way. Now, with the language under Section 1 of House Enrolled Act 1090, number six has been added to that list as conveyances to the state. The department will be working on updates to the instruction document that is uh, attached or linked and referenced uh, along on the forms page of our website with the sales disclosure form. It will not require the update or an update of the sales disclosure form itself. 
So county officials and practitioners will not need to be on the lookout for a new form, um, but they can find updated instruction document when the department completes the updates and we post that on our website. The next matter under the assessment category for legislation, uh, well, I'm going to first kind of I'm going to go back to, to 2023 during the 2023 session to give a little bit of context for some of the changes and clarifications that were completed during the 2024 session. So as it relates to apartment assessments during the 2023 legislative session under House Enrolled Act 1454, uh, Indiana Code 6 1.1 4 39 was amended to specify that for purposes of assessing apartment property, um, which is just the, the, the summarized way of referring to it, there's a more thorough definition of what, what the property is described as in code, and that reference is included in our memo. So, for purposes of clarification and just ease of reference in our presentation today, I just refer to it as apartment property. And for purposes of assessing apartment property, assessors were required to use the cost schedules issued by the department without any modifiers, adjustments, or other trending factors. However, during the 2024 session, House Enrolled Act 1328 uh, made a slight tweak to the 2023 legislation and specified that for apartment assessments that are under the cost approach, assessors are only allowed to use the modifiers or adjustments provided by the DLGF or that are included in the real property assessment guidelines. So the distinction between the 23 and the 24 is the location cost multipliers. With the language from 2023, the location cost multipliers that are released by the department each year could not be taken into account when looking at the assessment under the cost approach for these properties. In addition to making that clarification, uh, the language under 1328 also specifically prohibits the use of locally developed location cost multipliers, cost schedules, or market and trending adjustments. These provisions under the 2024 legislation are retroactively effective to January 1 of 2024 and would be applicable to the assessments that were finalized uh, about six months ago now. Also looking back to the 2023 session for another portion of the statute that was amended related to apartment assessments, um, there was language that was added related to the burden of proof to establish that the assessment is correct and that the assessed value is the lowest of the three appraisal approaches. And this burden of proof was identified as being by default with the assessing official. Come to 2024, the same section of House Enrolled Act 1328 that we previously referenced removed the line that references under the burden of proof for the assessor to establish that the assessment is correct. And it clarifies that the assessing official only has the default burden of proof to establish the assessed value is the lowest of the three appraisal approaches. And that also includes the burden of showing that they provided all three of the appraisal approaches as a part of the annual notice to property owners of any increases to the valuation. This is something that the department developed for uh, Form 11A specifically for these types of properties. Um, but the, the language that is correct uh, was largely a little bit vague, a little broad, and there had been previous appeals filed with the IBTR and the tax court related to issues of what is correct and how close to the accurate number or to an appraisal value is correct. And so in order to avoid ambiguity in the statute, there was the removal of the is correct portion of the burden of proof statute. The next section for assessment matters relates to the PETA-BOA member terms, and PETA-BOA stands for the Property Tax Assessment Board of Appeals. Under current law, it specifies that the term of a member of the county PETA-BOA is one year, and that term begins on January 1. Under Section 18 of 1328, the statute is amended to provide that a term of the member of a county PETA-BOA must be staggered to ensure that the appointment of a majority of the board does not expire in any single year. Now, it doesn't specify how the staggering should take place in a county, whether that means that you have a, a member or two of the, the three or five member board that has an automatic two year term or um, you stagger it so it starts at a different point. It, it merely is encouraging or requiring that there is a staggering to ensure that either a single county PETA or a multi county PETA board um, does not lose all members at the same time. This is meant to ensure that um, when office holders change or 
um, individuals who retire and no longer are able to participate on the board, that a county is never in the position of not having an appointed uh, member or some members of their PETA-BOA to ensure a continuity of operations and legacy information uh, being handed over from year to year. The next item related to assessment matters is with regard to business personal property late filing return penalties. Currently under code, it specifies that if an individual fails to file their business personal property return by the deadline or by the extended deadline, if they have been given approval to file late by the assessing official, automatically there's a $25 penalty applied. If the return is more than 30 days late, the taxpayer is also subject to a penalty of 20% of the overall tax liability that is due. With the changes under 1328, there is a graduated version of the penalty that is being applied. So instead of just being the flat 20% of the overall tax liability, now there is still the automatic $25 penalty that is applied for individuals that are late in filing their business personal property tax returns. However, if it is more than 30 days late, the taxpayer will be subject to the lesser of 10% of the overall tax liability or $10,000. If the filing is later than filed later than November 15th, then the penalty is still the $25 that is automatically applied and it's the lesser of 20% of the overall tax liability that would be owed or $50,000. So this is a more graduated scale as opposed to a flat amount that would apply to all taxpayers. In addition to graduating the scale for late business personal property return filings, uh, there was also the repeal of Indiana Code 6-1.1-37-7.5. Under that statute, it authorized a county to impose a 10% penalty when a business personal property tax return filing isn't received, but the taxpayer was able to show a proof of filing. Uh, in other words, if an individual was able to come into the county office and say, I, I, I did, I sent in my tax return and I have a um, certified mailing receipt here to show the date that it was mailed or I have a, a postage mark and for some reason it was lost in the mail. And in that case, the county was still able to impose a 10% penalty, even if the taxpayer could show that they did try to timely file their return. This, this section of statute has been repealed and both the graduated penalty structure and the repeal of that, that secondary section, they are both retroactively effective as of May 1. But in addition to those longstanding provisions or the new provisions that are placed in code, there are also changes that were outlined under Section 39 of House and World Act 1328. And under that section, it specifies that the new graduated penalty structure for late personal property return filings would also apply to any taxpayer that was subject to a late filing penalty for taxes that were first due and payable in 2023. Now, what does that mean? because uh, this it was retroactively effective and would have applied to individuals that made their filings and the deadline was May 15th of 2024, but this is saying it's for uh, late filings that were payable in 2023. Well, that's because Section 39 of House and World Act 1328 is a non-code provision, which means that it is transitory and it's a temporary law. Since non-code provisions are temporary and are often drafted to have limited applicability, the department generally does not outline the non-code provisions in our annual legislative update memos. However, because the language in section 39 of the bill has a broader applicability and would be in effect from January 1 to 2024 to June 30th of 2027, the department wanted to highlight it in our presentation as well as our memo. You'll see based on the screenshots on this slide from the bill outlining section 39, the non-code provision, it outlines eligible taxpayers, um, which means that an individual that did not timely file their return within 30 days of the filing deadline, and they've already made two installment payments for the assessment date that is first payable in 2023. Subsection B specifies that if the individual had an overall penalty amount that exceeded $50,000, that amount needs to be returned to that taxpayer. Now, they could have made two installment payments, but they didn't pay the entirety of it. And in that case, the county would need to modify what is listed as the outstanding obligation for the taxpayer in their tax and billing system to meet the $50,000. If an individual, either in the two installments or in one installment, um, pay the entirety of the late filing penalty, then 
the county would need to do a refund of the amount that exceeded $50,000 for that taxpayer. However, the department would note that the non-code provision does not speak to whether or not there is interest that would be due for the refund um, in this instance. Next item related to assessment matters is also under 1328, and it relates to tentative utility assessments. So for state distributable property tax filers, um, the department assesses those uh, those taxpayers and the property that is considered utility or state distributable property. And under statute, currently the department provides those taxpayers with a tentative assessment by no later than June 1st. Um, starting with assessments, first beginning in 2025, the department will also be required to provide to uh, county assessing officials information related to the tentative assessment, uh, whether that's just a percentage increase or decrease in the overall assessed value that the county may see with regard to state distributable utilities. Um, and the department believes that these provisions will help ensure that a county has um, the longest runway possible to know what changes could be coming to the overall assessed value within their county. The next item under assessment matters would be under Senate Enrolled Act 183, and this is one of the bills that uh, impacts both assessment matters and the, the legislation that relates to deductions and exemptions. So we'll cover it here in this one, um, but it is located in both memos. So under Senate Enrolled Act 183, um, Legislation is allowing a county fiscal body to adopt an ordinance exempting mobile homes and manufactured homes in the county from property taxation. If the county fiscal body adopts the exemption ordinance, the bill specifies that the county assessor shall not assess mobile homes or manufactured homes. The assessor is also required to automatically apply the exemption to mobile homes and manufactured homes in the county. The department will be working to update the property code list manual to include a new adjustment code for this specific county adopted exemption. The legislation also specifies that if the county fiscal body repeals or amends the exemption ordinance, um, that's possible. And although amending the ordinance can't necessarily specify that only a certain part of the county or only a certain taxing district of the county it would be applicable to because statute does require that if the ordinance is adopted, all taxpayers in the county will be treated the same with regard to mobile homes and manufactured homes. However, if a newly elected fiscal body comes in and decides that they no longer want to have the exemption ordinance, um, we would encourage assessors because of the, the possibility of that being repealed in the future to keep any of the actual data that was in their systems, the legacy systems for mobile home and manufactured home assessments. This is in part because um, although the department has you know, guidance and requirements for how long legacy data is retained in a county system, uh, whether they're switching vendors or just for purposes of data storage, uh, it's a couple of years, but technically based under the retention schedules for assessing officials that is prescribed by the Indiana Archives and Records Administration, it specifies that property record cards and any supporting documents related to property valuation can only be destroyed after 10 years and after receipt by the State Board of Accounts, audit report, and a satisfaction of unsettled charges. So I think in combination with that, we would just encourage um, assessing officials to not necessarily get rid of that data if a county fiscal body opts into uh, adopting the ordinance exempting mobile homes from property taxation. We're gonna now move into deductions and exemptions legislation. We did cover uh, the exemption, which is also under the 183, but in addition to that, we have language under House Enrolled Act 1120 and it relates to the disabled veteran deduction. Now, this is the deduction that the department refers to as the non-service connected disability deduction. I believe counties also occasionally refer to it as the partial deduction, um, but for purposes and for ease of the, the language that was in 1120, it's the deduction for disabled veterans that does have the assessed value threshold. Because what the bill does is it's increasing the assessed value threshold from 200 to 240,000, which means that individuals meeting all of the other eligibility requirements must not have property that exceeds an assessed value of 240,000. The change under the statute will first apply to 2024, pay 2025. And with the change under uh, House Enrolled Act 1120, 
Now, the over 65 deduction, the over 65 circuit breaker credit, and the veteran with a non-service connected disability deduction will all have an assessed value limitation of 240,000 beginning with 2024 pay 2025. However, unlike the over 65 deduction and the veterans deduction that we talked about with 1120, individuals that are first applying for the over 65 circuit breaker credit after December 31st of 2022, the assessed value limitation doesn't just apply to the homestead property or where the individual resides. It applies to all real property owned in Indiana. So although the assessed value threshold has been raised to be the same between all three of the tax incentives, there is still one distinction between the three. Also, uh, with regard to deductions and exemptions was language that was added under 1328. It was related to the homestead deductions and the ability for LLCs to claim the homestead deduction. During the 2023 session under Senate Rule Act 325, there were provisions under the homestead deduction statute. And at that time, 2023, it was under previously subsection K of that statute. And in that statute, it allowed an individual who has a principal place of residence uh, that is owned by a business entity. If the individual that resides in that property is a shareholder or partner or member of an entity and holds a membership or ownership percentage of um, the entity and the individual was eligible for that deduction on March 1st of 2009. So that was removed from uh, from the statute in 2023. And then in 2024, under House and World Act 1328, that same language was added back into the homestead deduction statute under what is now subsection Q. There are a few slight differences uh, in the language that was added in 2024, but those differences were just meant to uh, fully match and mirror the definition of homestead as it was amended in 2023. But for purposes of simplicity, I will note the language that was removed in Senate World Act 325 in 2023, it was effective January 1 of 2024. And then the language that was adding the language back into code was also effective January 1 of 2024. By default, that means that no property owner should be impacted uh, by the change and so the deletion and then reinsertion of the language into statute so long as they continue to meet the eligibility requirements. Last item related to deductions and exemptions is under House Enrolled Act 1120. So under this legislation, there were several deduction statutes that were included. And ultimately what it did is it moved the deadline for the submission of an application for these listed deductions to January 15th. Currently under code for all of these deductions, not only is the deadline uh, you know, January 5th, but there was also provision that specified that the application themselves had to be completed and filled out and signed by December 31st and then received by the county uh, by January 5th. Now, the application for the list of deductions has to be filled out, signed, completed, dated, and received by January 15th. So there's one date for all of the deductions listed. The changes to these statutes is effective for January 1 of 2025. The department would note that the application deadline for the heritage barn deduction, which is under Indiana Code 6-1.1-12-26.2, was not addressed in House Enrolled Act 1120, and therefore an application for this deduction must still be signed and completed by December 31st and filed with the county auditor by January 5th. Next area is for local budgeting matters legislation. To kick off local budgeting matters, we'll talk about controlled projects. So I'm going to go into a little bit of history for this one first. During the 2023 session, House Enrolled Act 1499 modified statute up until December 31st of 2024 um, to have thresh the threshold amounts that are used for determining whether a political subdivisions project is a control project and whether the petition and remonstrance or referendum process applies and it is based on the political subdivision's total debt service tax rate. Moving now to 2024, under House Enrolled Act 1120, the language in the bill extends the period by which a project is subject to either the petition and remonstrance or referendum based on the unit's total debt service rate through December 31st of 2025. In other words, it basically moved to the sunset back by one year, so it will continue to apply for one additional year. 
The language in 1120 also clarified that the total debt service rate does not include the tax rate imposed in a referendum debt service tax levy approved by the voters. So this means that the calculations that had been done in previous years would likely have included any referendums that were passed going forward um, as of retroactively affected January 1 of 2024, the total debt service rate that would be considered is going to exclude any referendum tax rate that have been approved by voters. Also with regard to controlled projects, uh, House Enrolled Act 1120 also provided uh, a new concept related to controlled projects that may have a change in scope. It provides that a project is subject to petition and remonstrance or a referendum as applicable if the scope of the project changes from what was originally advertised to taxpayers. Taxpayers have the ability to uh, meet the filing requirements and the number of individuals that have to petition to the appropriate political subdivision, and that's further outlined in the legislative update memo. Um, and if the officers, upon the receipt of a petition or objection from members of the community, determine that at a public hearing that the scope of the controlled project has subsequently changed beyond what was initially presented, the political subdivision would then be required to complete the petition and remonstrance process or a more formal referendum for that project. And if the majority of property owners and registered uh, voters signed the remonstrance against the controlled project after that determination that there's been a change in scope, uh, the political subdivision is no longer able to proceed with the change in scope for that controlled project. In that case, the political subdivision can either proceed with the controlled project, but only within the confines of what it was initially presented as, or they would have to terminate that project and then go through the process from the beginning. So this could be the instance if we, we a unit of government uh, had a project they undertook, they took uh, out of debt, and as a part of you know presenting that to the public, they were going to uh, they proposed a field house or a large sporting venue for its students. Um, the community had no opposition to it. They moved forward, and then uh, six months, ten months later, they decided to use some of those um, you know, debt dollars, some of the the money that they had obtained, to also build a library. That would be considered the change in scope, most likely. It would have to be considered under the new language that was added under House Enrolled Act 1120. The next area relates to amended CNAV submissions. So in previous legislative sessions, uh, there was a date or a deadline added that specified when an amended CNAV submission had to be made to the department by. Statute currently specifies that CNAV submissions to the department have to be completed and submitted by August 1st. And with the previous legislation, um, amended CNAVs where there was a change in error or something was identified, those had to be submitted by September 1st. Uh, understanding the reality that, you know, sometimes a county may not submit their original CNAV until after September 1st, there wasn't a lot of flexibility in statute that would have allowed them to identify errors and make corrections. So with the language under Section 12 of House Enrolled Act 1328, um, the deadline for an amended CNAV submission to the department is now the later of September 1st, or 15 days after the original CNAV submission is made. So if a unit of government submits uh, their first CNAV for the first time on you know, September 10th, that unit would have until September 25th to submit an amended CNAV. And this 15 day period is meant to give the unit um, the time that is needed to post notice and have the public meeting and hearing outlining the change or why the amended CNAV is needed. Um, and get that to the department. So there's the opportunity for underlying units or others that work with the county to help identify any errors that may not have been caught with the original submission. The next area is something that I will touch on a little bit today, but there will be more information that we, we compile and release to everybody in the coming months and years. Um, Additional appropriations, a lot of local officials might be familiar with the additional appropriations application that is currently already available through Gateway. Uh, this is a tool that is used by local officials to submit additional appropriations that have already um, had a hearing, they've had a vote, uh, there's a resolution adopting or the allowing the permissible use of dollars that can be spent in excess of the budgeted amounts that were approved by the, the appropriate fiscal body and certified by the department. But beginning January 1st of 2026, 
there will be kind of an expansion of what we currently have as a part of that application as political subdivisions will no longer be required to post public notice of hearings on the additional appropriation actions in their local newspapers. Public notices will now instead be submitted to Gateway and made available through budget notices. Um, the department is still currently working on the different ins and outs of how that will operate, but we believe it will operate very similar to how the current budget notices functions and allows taxpayers to subscribe and receive those updates on a pretty regular basis. Also included as a part of the language, there is an outline of the different things that uh, must be submitted um, you know, in advance of holding the public hearing that is going to discuss any additional appropriation that is being considered. Um, they have to submit the following information as is outlined on the slide, which is very similar to the information that has to currently be submitted to the department after the fact. And that includes the amount of the additional appropriation, the name of the affected fund, the account number of the affected fund, and the time, date, and place that the political subdivision is going to hold the public hearing on the proposed additional appropriation. For these public notices, the, the unit must post the required information on Gateway at least 14 days prior to the public hearing, and the department must make the information publicly available on Gateway at least 10 days prior to the public hearing. Now, for those that are familiar with Gateway, most of most all of the submissions are made available to the public in real time. So the additional four days could provide a cushion or a buffer to allow a unit to identify any corrections that are needed um, or changes or updates to it. But ultimately, it must be on Gateway 10 days before the public hearing. And again, this is effective January 1 of 2026. So it's not something that we will see implemented for at least a year and a half. The department will put together guidance, things like user guides, and a memo that corresponds to the release and update of this application when we get closer to that date. So anybody um, that would be using the new tool through budget notices and gateway should keep an eye out for that in the coming months. The next area uh, for local budgeting relates to excess levy appeals and binding units. So the first point here on the slide relates to any unit of government that is subject to the binding review process for their normal standard budget certification. Um, those are the units that may have an appointed board and they come, they meet, they set a budget and then they submit it to their overarching fiscal body for the final approval of any budget that would be adopted. For those units of government, for an excess levy appeal, they must also submit that excess levy appeal to the overarching and appropriate fiscal body before submitting the excess levy appeal to the department. This will ensure that individuals or units that spend a lot of time compiling this information um, have the approval of the group that is likely going to see any excess levy appeal that is approved by the department on the unit 1782 notice. Um, they're on board. Everyone's on the same page so we can ensure that everyone uh, knows what to expect and there's not any surprise when the 1782 notices come out. The second category relates to participating units of a fire protection territory. This also specifies that any participating unit that wishes to submit an excess levy appeal to the department can only do so after receiving approval through an adopted resolution of all of the other participating units of a fire protection territory. So in essence, if a fire protection territory um, is comprised of five different units and one of those units wants to submit an excess levy appeal, they would need to obtain approval through an adopted resolution from the other four participating units. This ensures that, again, everybody that is impacted or relates to the excess levy appeal is on the same page. And it also ensures that there is a, a greater level of transparency and there is an assurance that there's been some consideration that uh, of double taxation concerns. And so we're not increasing a levy for one area that will be served in another and that, every, uh, that the uh, excess levy appeals only cover uh, specific areas that all participating units are aware of. And the last item for local budgeting matters is in 1328 and is related to the referendum review that is done by the department. Currently under code, it states that the department has 10 days to review submitted ballot questions for purposes of property tax referendum. With the change in the public question language a couple of sessions ago, the department now receives information from two different groups. One is from the unit, most often a school corporation, and then the other is from the county auditor, 
who has been tasked with calculating the percentages of potential increase in both homestead and business property. With submissions coming from two different places, the, the sections in this bill merely clarify that the 10 day period for the department to review submitted ballot questions does not begin until a full submission is received from both the unit of government and the county auditor. Next, we'll look at local income tax legislation. Under House Enrolled Act 1121, there was language added that relates to um, separate units of government that go through a merger or consolidation. This uh, this idea came from a situation where there was a there was a county with two fire protection districts that were uh, contiguous to one another, and they they decided that it was a better use of the government's resources and time to to consolidate and to have one larger fire protection district. The only downside to the consolidation was for purposes of the distribution of lit. Part of the calculation is based on units that are in existed as of a certain date. When the consolidation occurs and therefore there is the termination or expiration of a pre-existing unit, that unit that no longer exists, you're, there's, there's part of that calculation that is going to be lost. So to remove what may have been an unintended consequence of you know, mergers or consolidations of local government units under the Government Modernization Act, uh, the provision specifies that the units are entitled to a combined pro rata distribution of local income tax revenue allocated to each applicable unit that was in existence on the previous January 1st date. It requires the department to make these adjustments. There are also revenue adjustments that were related to the financial institutions tax, and it outlines adjustments and considerations that the Auditor of State, now concert, uh, referred to as the State Comptroller, will incorporate. And there are also considerations for adjustments for CVET or the commercial vehicle excise tax distributions for when units merge. Next for local income tax matters, there was language under House Enrolled Act 1121 related to a new lit type, and the new lit type is for acute care hospitals. Section 7 of that legislation adds the lit rate for expenses related to acute care hospitals. The legislative update memo does provide a definition of what is defined to be an acute care hospital, and specifically it allows um, it, the new section allows for a county fiscal body to adopt an ordinance to oppose a tax rate for the acute care hospitals within a county. It is not increasing the overall cap amount uh, applicable to counties for the, the total local income tax rate that they can't exceed, but it is adding a new tool in the toolbox and an, another type that can be utilized. And so it also specifies that the lit rate that may be adopted by the county fiscal body must be an increment of one hundredth of one percent or 0.01%, and it may not exceed one tenth of 1%, or 0.1%. The revenue generated by the tax rate must be distributed directly to the county before the remainder of the expenditure rate revenue is distributed. Um, we oftentimes get questions with new lit types about permissible uses of funds and, and where distributions have to go. Um, oftentimes, we partner with the State Board of Accounts to ensure that uh, these, these questions are answered. So if there are any questions about the new lit type and how dollars can be spent or where they have to be distributed or deposited, uh, the department would encourage anyone to reach out to the State Board of Accounts with those questions. Also related to local income tax matters is a provision under House Enrolled Act 1328 for local income tax levy freeze rate reductions. So currently under statute, um, any of the counties that have, that were uh, one of the ones to adopt the lit levy freeze concept, there are 11 counties that did so. If they would like to reduce their lit levy freeze tax rate, they have to come to the department for review and approval. And so the language under 1328 now allows the department to consider the balance of a levy freeze stabilization fund during the review of the county's request to reduce their lit levy freeze tax rate. The county adopting body is required to provide the department with a determination of the amount in that fund for purposes of the department's review. Um, this is a consideration that can be made for, for those units or those counties that might have a, a sizable stabilization fund balance that, based on the current operations with that uh, levy freeze rate, have not been able to really eat down that fund balance. 
Um, it's not something that the department will automatically look at. It will only be something that is considered if a unit requests and takes it into account with a submission to the department uh, for a requested reduced lit levy freeze tax rate. And the last item for local income tax matters is in House and World Act 1121. And this relates to uh, counties with lit councils with a single voting block. Sections 1, 3, and 6 of this bill amend various provisions of the code and extend certain requirements to uh, counties with a single voting block through May 31st of 2025. So similar to some other ones we talked about today, this is kind of you know extending the sunset date that is uh, currently in code for these statutes, and this was effective upon passage. Next, we're going to look at school funding legislation. So under House Enrolled Act 1120, uh, there are provisions that are related to school corporation levy limitations. And this specifies that the limitation period um, that is extended to apply for property taxes first due and payable in 2025. However, it clarifies that the limitation does not apply to operating referendum that were imposed by a unit that was designated as a distressed political subdivision at the time the referendum was approved. Additionally, the operating referendum approved by voters after December 31st of 2022 and before January 1st of 2025, and then first for taxes uh, for taxes imposed and first due and payable in 2024 or 2025. So this again, uh, for the, the second part at least, there's another one year extension of provisions that were passed um, under previous legislative sessions. It does make one additional change though. For taxes that are first due and payable in 2024, like we said, the operating referendum levy cannot exceed the lesser amount that it could have been levied by the school corporation if the maximum referendum rate was imposed, and that amount is multiplied by 1.03. The change now is for taxes that are first due and payable in 2025, so it will be relevant for purposes of budgets that are being uh, considered or crafted uh, towards the second half of this year for 2025. And in those cases, the operating levy limitation will be based on a calculation that includes ADM. There is a, a lengthy calculation. There's, I believe, eight steps to it. We have outlined all of those steps of the calculation within the legislative update memo. I encourage everybody that has any questions about what's considered um, as a part of that calculation to take a look at that memo. These provisions under uh, House and World Act 1120 were retroactively effective January 1 of 2024. Another piece of legislation, which is Senate Rolled Act 270, relates to levy distributions to charter schools. Now, there was language under uh, House Enrolled Act 1001 during the 2023 session that related to a required distribution of operations fund dollars, or in some cases, there was language that was in another bill that was specific to referendum dollars. Both of these provisions related to distributions to charter schools applied only to four counties. So I'll preface these slides with that. And the four counties are Marion County, Vanderburg, Lake County, and St. Joseph. So Section 10 of Senate Enrolled Act 270 amends Indiana Code 20-46-1-8 to provide that a distribution to a charter school of proceeds from a referendum held before May 10th of 2023 does not provide an exemption from the provisions of that chapter of code. So the department um, understands this provision to be that if there was a school corporation that would have otherwise been subject to the potential sharing of referendum distributions with local charter schools that may have taken an action, uh, the board adopting a resolution wanting to put a referendum on the ballot uh, prior to May 10th, that could have otherwise been exempt from the uh, potential sharing of these dollars, um, the sharing would be still required. Uh, the department is not aware of any school corporations that would have fallen kind of within this time window, but it's just clarifying that for anything that would have happened a few days before the May 10th date in the in the bill, it would have applied to them. Section 11 of Senate Rolled Act 270 is also meant to clarify that distributions to charter schools from the school corporations operating fund levy revenue, and this is the language that was in House and Rolled Act 1001, must be based on the amount collected rather than imposed by the school corporation. And again, this will refer to only the four counties that were previously referenced, which is Marion, Lake, Vanderburg, and St. Joseph County. This section of the bill was effective July 1 of 2024. Next, looking at levy distributions to charter schools returning back to the scope of referendum 
and it applies again to the four counties that we've previously referenced. It's adding additional information or more clarification on what must be provided uh, by a school corporation to any area charter schools that could be eligible to opt in or participate as a part of the referendum. The information that must be included includes the total amount of the school corporation's expected need, the per student estimate for that amount using the number of students enrolled in the school corporation, the date on which the school board will vote on the resolution, and the, this required information was effective upon passage. In addition to these pieces, it also specifies that the school corporation must include in its referendum a disclosure statement that includes the following. The salaries of each position within the school corporation or charter school listed from highest salary to lowest salary and a link to the gateway for access to individual salaries. This will generally be information that is reported um, through something that is to State Board of Accounts. If there are questions on what that link should go to, we would encourage any um, unit to reach out to State Board of Accounts with that question. This statement that is required must be posted at least 30 days before the referendum is held in a general or primary election, rather than 30 days before the resolution to hold the referendum is adopted. Now turning over to fire funding legislation. First provision we'll look at is under House Enrolled Act 1120, and this relates to township fire and EMS fund separation. During the 2023 session, there was legislation that allowed for townships to specifically separate funding into two separate funds, one for fire and one for EMS, to better identify what the expenses were for each service. For those units that opted to do a fund separation, language was added under Section 59 of 1120 that requires a township that has separated its township fire funding and EMS funds into separate funds to make a one-time transfer of any remaining cash balance into the two separate funds. It specifies that the township board shall determine the amount of the remaining cash that is to be transferred to each fund. Um, this is a little bit of cleanup clarification from State Board of Accounts just to ensure that for auditing purposes, all of the uh, previous the previous fund that existed uh, is wrapped up and there's documentation to show where things went. The next section related to fire funding um, is for contracts that are for fire and EMS services or with an entity that provides fire and EMS services. Currently under Indiana Code 5-14-3.8-3.5, there's a requirement for all political subdivisions that enter into a contract for an amount that see, exceeds $50,000 to upload that contract to Gateway. This is done through the file transmission portal. The new requirement under this legislation specifies that for any political subdivision that enters into a contract for fire or EMS services or with an entity that provides fire and EMS services for any amount, uh, they will need to enter these contracts as an upload to Gateway, regardless of that contract amount. Now, the distinction between for fire and EMS or with an entity, there could be an entity that that is typically what they provide, or it's fire and EMS, but you know the unit may be contracting with them for some other purpose. Even if it's for some other purpose, that contract would technically be required to be submitted and uploaded to Gateway. These, uh, these provisions under the bill also specify that the contract uploads must be completed within 60 days of the contract's execution date or when it's been signed by both parties. It also specifies that if a participating unit of a fire protection territory submits the agreement establishing the territory, each of the other participating units will be considered to have complied with this upload requirement. So if there's a fire protection territory with four units, um, if one of the units of the fire protection territory uploads the, the formation or the agreement that establishes that territory, the other three units would not be required to submit the same agreement. The department would encourage fire protection territories to identify um, what unit will be responsible for uploading the contract to ensure that it, uh, the requirement under statute has been met. Legislation also specifies that the executive of the political subdivision is required to upload these contracts and therefore they would be considered the default access permission to to upload contracts. However, the executive body may by ordinance or resolution identify another individual that uh, should be given access and would be required to upload the qualifying contracts. This could be another individual within the executive body. It could be someone from the fiscal 
body uh, or fiscal officer for the unit, but any ordinance or resolution that is adopted should be submitted to the Department of Local Government Finance no later than five days after the ordinance or resolution is passed. Um, there's more information about where these should be submitted within the memo that we released for fire funding legislation matters. Um, it would be submitted to uh, support at dlgf.in.gov and the access permissions will be coordinated through our communications division. Additionally, if the executive of the political subdivision is required to submit a statement to the department by no later than March 2nd of each year, attesting that the political subdivision has uploaded any qualifying contracts for the immediately preceding year. So they, uh, all units, even if they don't have any contracts, will have to go into uh, Gateway to complete what will be a very simple attestation um, survey of all qualifying contracts uh, have been uploaded to Gateway. There will likely be options that we incorporate. Uh, no, the unit of government has no applicable contracts to have uploaded, and that uh, has to be submitted by March 2nd. However, um, the provisions also specify that the department cannot approve a budget or a supplemental appropriation of the political subdivision until the attestation is filed. So even though the deadline for submitting is March 2nd, the attestation submission will operate the same way that the department currently handles annual financial report uh, submissions, 100R submissions, and nepotism policy submissions um, as it relates to those reports being done to the State Board of Accounts. The same language that the department cannot approve a budget or proceed with finalizing, uh, certifying a budget or an additional appropriation to the political subdivision until it confirms that those reports have been made. This will function the same way. So right at the last stretch of budget certification is, is when the department will be checking to see if the attestation that was due on March 2nd has been completed. The last section that we're going to go over relates to economic development legislation. In previous sessions, there was language that was added to code, which allowed for the establishment of an innovation development district, uh, often referred to as an IDD. In many ways, it's, it has similarities to an allocation area that's associated with a TIF district. Um, and there was also language that prohibited uh, kind of the stacking or pancaking of um, allocation areas between an IDD or a TIF district. The language that was added under Senate Enrolled Act 256 specifies that the Indiana Economic Development Corporation may subsequently designate territory that is located in an existing allocation area as part of an innovation development district. However, the allocation area may not be renewed or extended until the IDD expires. This means that if there is a portion uh, of the county or of a unit of government that has been established as a TIF district or has an underlying allocation area, if there is interest in establishing an IDD on top of or in an area that also includes pre-existing allocation areas as well as other areas, that is permissible. However, the underlying allocation area for that pre-existing TIF um, can't be renewed or extended. Additional parcels can't be added to kind of prolong uh, the time span beyond the, the, the set time span for that TIF district um, once an IDD has been established on top of it. Additionally, the provision specified that the uh, Innovation Development District will include territory uh, that is, in a, if, it, if it does include territory located in a pre-existing allocation area, the TIF and the uh, Indiana Economic Development Corporation must enter into an agreement establishing the terms and conditions governing the IDD, including provisions that are currently in code, which are fully outlined in our legislative update memos, a provision that prohibits the city, county, town, or other entity that established the pre-existing allocation area from incurring additional debt without first obtaining consent from the IADC, and three, a provision requiring the maintenance of all applicable property tax records for the parcels located within the IDD. This will include both potentially those parcels that are a part of a pre-existing allocation area, as well as parcels that are a part of the IDD, but are not a part of a pre-existing allocation area. If an agreement can't be reached, then the IDD cannot be established. The department um, knows that for purposes of the tip neutralization, those are the times when we kind of collect information on the IDDs and how this will function. 
But outside of that, potentially some of the initiation and some of the ins and outs about how the IDD will function, the department would encourage any unit with questions to reach out to the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, and they would be the best source of information for some of these more specific questions. But before we jump to the last item, I will also reference that in Senate Rollback 256, it also specifies that if an IDD includes territory that is in a pre-existing allocation area, the county auditor will continue to allocate to the existing allocation area any incremental property tax revenues that would otherwise be allocated to the IDD until the existing allocation of the IDD expires. In other words, this means that any property tax revenue that is the increment revenue for property tax that would have otherwise always gone to the underlying or the pre-existing allocation area will still go to them. The only thing that will go to the IDD at the time that their overlap occurs would be the individual income tax as well as the gross retailer sales tax. So the property tax revenue will still be um, used for the underlying pre-existing allocation area. And the last item that I'll go through quickly, I know we're coming up on time, relates to language that was added back during the 2022 session. Uh, during that session under House Enrolled Act 1260, uh, it specified that residential property would be identified for purposes of what is residential property within a TIF district um, by one, it's the assessed value of property that is allocated to the 1% homestead land and improvement category in a county tax and billing system. And two, the residential assessed value as defined for purposes of calculating the rate for local income tax property tax relief that is designated or allocated for residential property that is defined under code. So this, this provision that was added under 1260 was for any new uh, TIF districts or allocation districts under, I think it's a category of six different areas that were established after June 30th of 2024. Now for one of those types, I believe it's the, the one type, the, the most generic of the allocation types, the, the standard TIF statute. For that statute, it has pushed back the date of which any newly established TIF districts will identify residential property within this new definition to June 30th of 2025. However, the other allocation area types, which have been outlined in the memo, um, will have for all new TIF districts established the identification of residential property as uh, defined under that 2022 legislation. Here's a quick example to show what it means when it says that it's the 1% homestead property as well as um, any allocation for residential property as it's a part of a property tax relief income tax rate that is adopted. For the example that's on the screen, it does see that the, they, there was the adoption of a property tax relief rate and within the allocation categories, of which there are currently five, one of the ones that was selected or there was an allocation accounted for for residential property as defined by 6, 1.1, 20 20.6-4 uh, would be residential property, which would include apartment properties and other property types that are defined under code. So there's a full breakdown and illustration of, of what, the, what that means for that second part of what is residential property included within the memo. Additional information, as we've referenced throughout today's presentation regarding changes from the 2024 legislative session can be found on the department's website. There are seven legislative update memos that were released yesterday uh, over all seven of the topics we discussed today. And as always, if there are any questions, you can always feel free to contact David Marusars, my Deputy General Counsel, as well as myself. And each of the legislative update memos does have contact information at the bottom as well. At this time, I'll turn it back to Jenny if she has any closing notes that she'd like to provide to everyone. Thank you, Emily. Um, so just as a reminder, we will send out the email with the PowerPoint, the video, the survey, and the CE form, and you will get that later this week. Um, as if you need CE credit, please complete the CE form, and if you're an assessor, submit that to our office. If you are with a different elected official office and need CE credit, then please contact your association or governing body as far as how to record that information. Um, if you are an attorney, um, please complete the survey and enter in your attorney number on the last um, field that is on the survey, but we do greatly appreciate any of the feedback that you do provide 
provide to us um, on that survey as we plan for future webinars. Um, we did have one question come in. Um, it, it came in as anonymous. So if you um, were the author of that question, please send me an email and we'll get you an answer back regarding that question, um, just so we that we know who to respond to. So we want to thank you all for joining us again today, and we hope to see you at a future webinar. And I hope you have a great afternoon.